I'm delighted to present to you our, our second webinar in our series. This one is, the series is called Work Supports for Child Health, the Role of Paid, Family, and Medical Leave. And uh, this comes to you thanks to Policies for Action, Policies in Law Research to Build a Culture of Health. And this is sponsored by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We will have one more in our series of three, and that will be at the end of May. So we really appreciate uh, all of you joining us. We had a, a lot of participants last month on uh, maternal mortality, and infant mortality is, of course, uh, just as important. I'm going to introduce uh, each speaker before they speak, but I do want to point out that um, this entire hub, uh, which is about uh, work and family policies and how we can show that they have health and economic benefits to lower income and middle income families. It's a 30 month project found, sponsored by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is done jointly with the University of California at Berkeley. So I'm particularly pleased that um, in this uh, panel, we have one of our researchers from IWPR and um, um, so as a, as a participant. Uh, so, I think, uh, oh, right, I'm sorry. I now have some data, so we're going to present some data. Um, I just wanted to provide an overview of the infant mortality statistics that we have. And uh, these are either from Child Trends, who follow this, or uh, CDC. And in the first slide, you can see the tremendous uh, racial and ethnic differences in uh, infant mortality in 2016, which is the latest year we have available. And these uh, infant mortality rates are per 1,000 live births. So non-Hispanic black is the highest at 11.4 per 1,000 live births among black women, 9.4 for American Indian, Alaska Native women uh, and their children, 7.4 for Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander children and their mothers, and um, 5.0 for Hispanic children and mothers, 4.9 for non-Hispanic whites. Those two numbers are uh, quite similar, of course. And then with the lowest infant mortality is um, those for Asian mothers, 3.6 over 1,000 live births. Then in the next graph, we are looking at time trends from 2004 to 2016, uh, a period of uh, 13 years. And we, we just displayed here, to keep the graph simple, uh, three of our largest uh, racial ethnic groups. Uh, at the top, with the highest uh, infant mortality is black or African American women. It's moved down from uh, almost 14 per 1,000 to um, about 12.5 per 1,000, or 13, I guess, per 1,000 uh, in 2016. And Hispanic and Latina women uh, and births have moved from just below six in 2004 uh, to a little bit, oh, about a little bit lower. But the interesting thing is that a slight gap has appeared between them and, and white women. So on this chart, uh, for the large ethnic and racial groups, white non-Hispanic women have, have the lowest infant mortality. And that gap uh, between Hispanic, Latina, and whites is new. Uh, it's a small gap compared to the black gap, but I know that researchers have uh, commented on that. And then uh, there's quite a large literature on low birth weight babies, which is thought to be the main cause of infant mortality. And so here we have it again for the major ethnic groups, and this one is from Child Trends, um, and this is in 2016. The, latest year for which data is available. Uh, so we can see that um, these um, low birth weight babies and very low birth weight babies are especially high, again, among non-Hispanic blacks. Uh, they're almost the same for all the other groups, with the Asian Pacific Islanders uh, being a little bit high and American Indian Alaska Natives being a little bit high compared to non-Hispanic whites and Hispanics. So this is just to make sure you have some general background before our researchers get into their talks. Is everybody able to hear me? I just want to check. I guess you can uh, send in your comment. Comment, yeah. 
uh, if you can't hear. Um, but I think now we'll move on to Jessica Milley from IWPR, our first speaker. Uh, Jessica is an economist. She came to us from um, the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, where she received her PhD. Uh, she's also a scholar in residence at American University, and she oversees all our work on paid sick days, providing technical assistance to dozens of communities across the country, exploring paid sick days policies. Um, and in addition, here at IWPR, uh, she leads research projects on uh, women in patenting, women in advancing in uh, leadership in the business world. And she did do a project for us on breastfeeding. But the research she's presenting today is a project she did on breastfeeding uh, with researchers from outside IWPR. And I know she's excited to get started. So Jessica, please go ahead. Thank you so much for being with us. All right, well, thank you, Heidi, and thank you to everyone who is tuning in this afternoon for, for being here. I'm really excited to uh, talk with you a little bit about some ongoing work that I've been doing in my free time uh, with my colleague, Aaron George. And we're at the point now where we've more or less firmed up our main analyses in the paper and are just working on some model extensions based on earlier reviewer feedback. So while this is probably not the final version of our results, we're pretty confident that the overall story is going to be pretty much the same. Uh, so without further ado, uh, why should we be thinking about breastfeeding when we're talking about the impact of paid leave on child health? Uh, well, I have a, a quick little summary of the causal chain here that I'll go into a little bit more detail on in a minute, but briefly it looks like this. Uh, the whole idea behind paid leave is that it's supposed to encourage mothers to stay home after giving birth, and it delays their return to work so that they can recover from uh, giving birth and bond with their child. And so this delayed return to work in turn makes it more likely that she's going to establish breastfeeding and breastfeed for longer since she's stay at, staying at home longer. And then finally, this increased breastfeeding carries with it numerous health benefits for the infant. Now, just to uh, go into a little bit more detail about what we already know, uh, one of the biggest considerations when mothers are deciding whether or not to breastfeed, though certainly not the only consideration, um, is if and when they're planning to return to work. And the literature is somewhat mixed on the impact of mother's intention of returning to work on initiation. Um, some studies show that a mother's return to work has no impact on whether or not she breastfeeds and that having a longer leave isn't really going to change this. Um, but other studies have um, found a significant impact and that uh, mothers are less likely to breastfeed if they plan to return to work. The evidence is a bit clearer, though, on the impact of returning to work on the duration of breastfeeding. And the, even though we have policy supports in place to protect breastfeeding mothers at work, they really aren't implemented uniformly across employers. And so it's really difficult for a lot of moms to balance a breastfeeding and pumping schedule with their work responsibilities as well. And so it's usually around the time that mothers return to work that we see breastfeeding uh, uh, cease. All right, bringing it back to the main topic of the webinar though, there's a pretty substantial literature out there on the health benefits of breastfeeding for infants. Uh, on the more serious side, breastfeeding is linked with a reduction in sudden infant death syndrome and necrotizing enterocolitis, but it's also been shown to reduce the risk of chronic conditions such as asthma and diabetes. And um, there's even literature out there on some more minor health benefits like protection from GI problems and promoting healthier weight status. Um, and just to note, uh, most of these studies have looked at the health impacts of any breastfeeding, uh, but some have found that the effects are a bit more pronounced among infants who are breastfed for longer periods of time. All right, to give you an idea of how prevalent breastfeeding is in the U.S. This table here shows breastfeeding data for infants born in 2014 by the income to poverty ratio of the household. 
and the U.S. Uh, total rates are at the bottom, um, and also the, the bottom row represents the Healthy People 2020 goal for each of those breastfeeding indicators. And so any cells highlighted in red mean that we haven't quite met that particular breastfeeding goal yet. And we can see that we've already met the initiation goal and the goal for exclusive breastfeeding through three months, but those longer durations are still really elusive for us. And it also seems that low-income mothers are experiencing even greater challenges with regard to breastfeeding because they're falling substantially behind on all of those uh, breastfeeding measures. And so this is the point where I throw in my caveat that aggressive promotion of breastfeeding can be harmful if it's not paired with appropriate education and support from healthcare professionals. And we should also recognize that not all women want to or can breastfeed, and that's also okay, but it's reasonable to assume uh, that some women aren't breastfeeding for as long as they'd like to, and if we can find ways to support them, then we, we absolutely should. And so paid leave is one way that we can go about doing this. Well, as I'm sure you all know, uh, the U.S. is the only developed nation in the world that does not guarantee some kind of paid leave for parents around the birth of their, their children. Uh, what we do have is the FMLA Act, uh, which provides unpaid uh, leave around the birth of a child. Uh, but it has some pretty strict eligibility requirements, uh, which mean that many people aren't even covered by this unpaid leave and recent estimates uh, show us that about 59% of all workers actually are covered by FMLA. So we basically have this paid leave landscape that doesn't really even exist, uh, which means that many, particularly low-income moms, will return to work right after giving birth because they really can't afford to stay home. Now some states are starting to fill this gap uh, for example, five states, uh, California, Hawaii, New York, Rhode Island, and New Jersey, have temporary disability insurance laws, which have been around for quite a while. And these programs provide six weeks of paid leave around uh, a normal birth of a child and provide even longer amounts of leave for complicated births. Uh, but the states vary in their eligibility requirements, their wage replacement rates and benefit caps, and so on. Uh, several states have passed paid family leave laws as well, and you'll note a substantial amount of overlap with the TDI states that I just mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, all of the TDI states except Hawaii now have paid family leave programs in place. Uh, the notable exceptions are Washington State, D.C., and Massachusetts, and those states are going to be the first without uh, existing TDI programs to implement their own paid family leave programs. Um, just like TDI, these paid leave programs vary also state by state in their eligibility and benefit amounts. So what we have here is a really nice experimental environment to examine the impact of paid leave on breastfeeding. Uh, since California was the first state to pass and implement a, a paid family leave law, we know a bit more about their experience. Um, there have been a couple of studies that have been conducted in the state, and but, um, the majority of them have found evidence of a positive impact on breastfeeding initiation and duration within the state. But due to the timing of the laws being passed and legs in data availability, most of the research to date has uh, been focused solely on California. And so our research is expanding on this literature in two specific ways. One, we are the first that we're aware of to look at the link between paid leave and breastfeeding in New Jersey specifically. And two, we specifically look at the impact that paid leave has on low-income mothers. All right, since we're looking at New Jersey specifically, I'll give you a little bit more information on their policy environment. Um, they already had TDI in place well before our sample period started. 
So just like California, which also had TDI in place uh, before passing their paid leave law, this means that we're really not evaluating the impact of access to any paid leave, but rather the impact of additional paid leave on breastfeeding rates. So New Jersey implemented their uh, paid family leave law in 2009, and as I just mentioned, this represents an extension of their TDI benefits, which means that uh, new mothers received an additional six weeks of leave on top of the six weeks already provided by TDI. Um, additionally, the wage replacement rate is 66%, and that is up to a maximum of $650 per week. And so because of this policy setting, we're expecting the results uh, of our analysis to represent a lower bound estimate of the impact of paid leave on breastfeeding. Right. For this study, we use data from the 2006 to 2017 National Immunization Survey. And since children were aged 19 to 35 um, months old at the time of the interview, that means that the survey covered births uh, that occurred between 2003 and 2016. And real quick, uh, to give you an idea of what our New Jersey sample looked like um, in, in the data, most of our mothers are a little bit older, and the majority had at least some college education. Um, nearly half of all of the children in the sample are firstborn children. And in terms of our breastfeeding outcomes, about 76% of infants were breastfed uh, prior to the paid leave law being implemented. And among those who were breastfed, the average duration was about 234 days, which is, I think, just shy of eight months. Uh, so to answer our question of how New Jersey's paid leave law impacted breastfeeding among mothers in the state, uh, we used a standard difference in difference model where our coefficient of interest is on New Jersey post-implementation. Uh, so this means we're looking at births that occurred in 2009 and after. We run this model relative to a couple of different control groups, um, but for all of them, we're excluding California from the analysis since they already had a paid leave law in place at the beginning of our sample, and we didn't really want to muddy our results by including it. Uh, so our control groups include all other states uh, in the, the U.S., the other TDI states, so those states that had a similar policy environment to New Jersey, and then the three largest states in our sample. Um, our outcomes of interest include indicators for any breastfeeding as well as uh, the duration of breastfeeding. And we include uh, mother and child demographic controls in our list of explanatory variables as well as uh, state and year fixed effects and some state level um, variables like median household income, unemployment rates, poverty rates, uh, and so on. All right, so we ran this first for the full sample regardless of uh, household income level, and we found some evidence that the law increased breastfeeding initiation rates. So you'll see that relative to the three largest states in the sample, the law increased breastfeeding initiation rates by about 6.3 percentage points. Uh, but outside of that, there really wasn't much impact of the law in the full sample. So now we get to our second question, which was how does this effect differ for low income and for higher income women? And, and why do we care? Well, breastfeeding rates are particularly low among low-income women, as we saw in the table that I showed you a little bit earlier. But low-income mothers are also less likely to have access to paid leave generally. Um, so the law is more likely to impact them and to influence their decision to stay home after giving birth. So as with uh, the full sample, we also see some evidence that the paid leave law increased breastfeeding initiation rates um, for low-income women. Relative to um, mothers in the other TDI states that had similar policy environments, the law increased breastfeeding initiation among low-income mothers in New Jersey by about 16.4 percentage points. 
and that's a huge jump. Uh, breastfeeding rates among the low-income group were about 68% before the law was implemented. So this increase represents uh, about a 24 percentage uh, increase in breastfeeding initiation for low-income women. Interestingly, we also find that the law resulted in a reduction in breastfeeding duration among the low-income mothers in our sample of between 48 and 86 days relative to the um, pretreatment average of 213 days. And so we were kind of scratching our heads when we, we saw this result and we're kind of wondering why this is. And we think that it makes sense for the low-income sample if you think that there was a compositional change in the mothers that were breastfeeding as a result of the law. And we already saw that there's some evidence that the law increased breastfeeding initiation rates. Um, and so these marginal breastfeeders who would not have breastfed if not for the law um, are, are entering this breastfeeding sample now, and they may not be breastfeeding for as long as those that had given birth before the law. And so because of that, we think that they might be dragging the average duration down um, as a result. Uh, we ran a similar analysis for the above poverty sample, but we didn't find that the law had any impact on initiation or duration which I think is interesting because it means that the effect of the law on breastfeeding is pretty much entirely concentrated in that low-income population. So taking all of this together, we've, we have some reason to think that New Jersey's paid family leave law had a positive impact on infant health outcomes, particularly for those low-income households. Um, and the reason why we say this is that we saw that more infants were breastfed after the law was enacted. Um, and we've also seen from the literature that breastfeeding of any duration has been linked to improved infant health outcomes. And so even though we have that compositional effect that dragged down average duration, those infants are still going to see numerous health benefits as a result of having been breastfed at all. And so because we're looking at the low-income population uh, specifically, policy design is going to be very important moving forward in determining the extent of the impact of the laws passed in other states. Um, this is especially true of things like the wage replacement rate and the maximum benefit allowed. Uh, because the need to earn a wage and to provide for their family is uh, really strong for those low-income mothers. And so having those higher wage replacement rates um, and higher benefit amounts for that population is likely going to encourage more of those low-income moms to stay home and to stay home for longer after giving birth. And so as a result, we think uh, that they may be more likely to breastfeed their infants. And with that, I will turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you. Hi, this is uh, Heidi again. Uh, Jessica, thank you so much. That is really fascinating. And um, New Jersey, you did a good job. And for all we know, it's just as good a result in the other states with uh, paid family leave. Um, I'd now like to introduce Jennifer Greenfield. She's an assistant professor at the Graduate School of Social Work, University of Denver. Her research focuses on the intersection of health and wealth disparities across the life course, especially through the mechanism of family care work. She uh, seeks to identify and test policies that best support families as they balance work and caregiving. She studied paid leave, minimum wage policy, and economic self-sufficiency. And she frequently speaks on these issues through legislative testimony, guest commentaries, and uh, media interviews. Jennifer, welcome to our webinar, and thank you for participating. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to join uh, to join you in this this whole panel. Um, I thought I would start by um, explaining a little bit of how I came to um, looking at paid leave and influences on on infant health outcomes. Um, as as the introduction mentioned, my work has, has really focused on caregiving across the life course, and I had actually begun my career uh, looking specifically at caregiving for older adults. And then um, when I started my faculty position here at DU, ended up uh, giving birth to twins who came early and were uh, hospitalized in a neonatal intensive care unit for a month. And I suddenly realized as I was looking around me at Cribside with my kids 
that most of the moms there did not have access to paid leave. And so um, I was, you know, being given kind of, you know, daily encouragement by the nurses to hold the babies as much as I possibly could because it was so important for their health and development. And meanwhile, realizing that many of the moms and, and dads who were there simply did not have the opportunity um, to do that. And so that they were having to choose, um, you know, a, an intervention that uh, was to keep a roof over their head rather than supporting the health and development of their kids. Um, and so it really um, prompted me to want to expand my view a bit um, and look at how paid leave could be an important health intervention um, for uh, especially preterm infants. Um, so I thought I'd start by um, just giving a, kind of the quick overview of what I'm hoping to cover is um, this is um, that parents' access to paid leave um, is associated with a lot of infant um, health benefits. And um, through the, the work that I've been doing on studying um, the impact on preterm infants, um, we've seen, you know, there is growing a growing body of research that's looking specifically at how paid leave is related to um, birth outcomes um, specifically. Um, but we also see that there's a bi-directional relationship between economic security and health and, um, and you know, even um, uh, looking at the uh, previous presentation that the lower income mothers are less likely to be able to breastfeed and then that um, has, you know, resulting health impacts uh, potentially on their infants. And so thinking about how paid leave um, is an intervention that affects economic security and therefore can affect health, but that health also um, has that bi-directional relationship um, with economic security is important. Um, and that there are many indirect effects that are um, that are likely through improved parental health and mental health. And um, I think last month's webinar was focusing specifically on the uh, maternal health effects of paid leave. And I think it's really important. And sometimes it's difficult to tease out these effects. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that um, it, as part of this conversation. Um, and then also to acknowledge that um, although what what I'm focusing on specifically are um, health effects really with around the perinatal period and in the first year of, of life that uh, I think that this is an important conversation to have and I think that um, Whitney will be touching on that and, um, uh, and Wendy as well, thinking about how um, paid leave is an important intervention for children's health even beyond the infant stage. Uh, but for now I'll be focusing mostly on infants. Um, so I thought what I'd do is just give an overview of some specific um, pieces of research that are out there that I think um, can be useful, especially when we think about um, taking research to uh, lawmakers and, and helping to advocate for these policies. One, I think, key point is that um, access to paid leave among parents is significantly associated with reduced uh, infant hospitalizations. Um, and so, for instance, there's this study out of California that shows that infant hospitalizations decreased uh, somewhere between 3 and 6 percent after the implementation of their paid family leave benefit uh, statewide. Um, and they, they tested, they wanted to see what uh, could explain that specifically. And so they looked at um, different conditions um, that, that prompted these hospitalizations and found that the largest reductions in hospitalizations were for gastrointestinal and respiratory infections. Um, whereas there was a non-significant effect for hospitalizations from cancer um, and uh, diseases like that. And so um, what they conclude is that the likely mechanisms to explain this reduction in hospitalizations um, are two things primarily. The first is that when parents have access to paid leave, they're less likely to um, enroll their children in a group-based kind of daycare in those first few weeks of life. And this is when babies are just beginning to build their immunity. Um, and so a cold that they might catch even at six months of, of life or a year of life that would just be a cold in the first couple of weeks of life is potentially life-threatening. Um, and so decreasing use of group-based care in those first weeks can be critically important. Um, and then also there's um, an increased ability for parents to access preventive care. And so if they're off of work, they can get their baby into the doctor's appointments in a timely manner. Um, get the immunizations that, that babies need, and, and a different study has shown that there is actually an influence on um, uh, prevalence of immunizations among uh, babies of parents with paid leave. 
Um, and so that these two mechanisms help to reduce hospitalizations, which is important, of course, um, for the health of the baby, also um, for the mental health, stress, and financial health of the family. Um, but there's an overall econom economic effect that I think is also important to talk about, which is that for California, they estimated there was a reduction of about um, $218 million in hospital charges each year. And that savings is um, distributed across savings from families and out-of-pocket costs, uh, savings to um, insurers and the state who were providing um, health coverage, and then to hospitals as well. And so um, this is, I think, an argument to be made for those who, uh, who only hear in dollar signs that um, paid leave can be an important investment that actually has an ec economic benefit for families and the state. Um, a few other studies have found um, that the duration of leave matters, and I think that this is also a really important piece of the conversation. Um, and I can say even from talking with lawmakers about, well, why shouldn't, why should we just, uh, why should, shouldn't we go for just six months or six weeks of leave or four weeks of leave? Why does it have to be 12? Do we really need to do 12? Um, so there are several studies, and I've highlighted two here, that actually, um, really show that, that the length of leave is important and that there is something about having 12 or more weeks of leave that may be really important for infant health. Those first 12 weeks of life are often uh, talked about as the fourth trimester, um, and, and being able to keep infants home during that entire time may be important. So um, in this uh, first study, um, there's a study that was actually a survey of 700 mothers across the U.S. Um, and they found that among mothers who had access to more than 12 weeks of leave, they, their infants were less likely to have been hospitalized uh, post-birth. Um, but in that sample, only 3% of those mothers had more than 12 weeks of leave. Um, half of them had zero weeks of paid leave, and only about a quarter had somewhere between one and six weeks of leave. And so this is, um, I think, a really important finding to show that having Having that full length of leave is really important for the baby's health. Uh, there's also this study um, that was uh, looked at uh, over 300,000 births globally and found that when mothers had access to paid leave, um, there was overall a 13% reduction in infant deaths um, and um, that a lot of that was in a reduction in the postnatal death. So it wasn't in that uh, very first weeks of life, but in that, uh, you know, first year of life. And, um, and so this was, I, I think, is it really important? There's also uh, been a couple of other studies that have found similar results um, and talking about how paid leave is actually an important uh, intervention for infant mortality. Um, and I see a question uh, asking if um, we can share the studies. And I have a couple of slides at the end that have all of the references for these because um, I figured that they would be helpful. Um, so I didn't want to go too deep into the um, literature on paid leave and breastfeeding because Jessica's covered it so nicely already. Um, you know, but I, I think that another important point here, and I think that this, um, this actually emerges in the study Jessica presented as well, is that having those extra weeks of leave are critically important um, for being able um, to um, maintain breastfeeding over time. Um, and so, um, that we really need to be thinking not just for advocating for any paid leave at all, but to think um, really critically about how long the leave is and to advocate for 12 weeks or more as um, really important for a baby's health. Um, so then I thought I'd, I'd drill down a little bit uh, more specifically and to look at the relationship between paid leave and preterm infants. As I mentioned, um, this has been a particular area of interest for me um, just based on, you know, a question that popped up while I was in the hospital with my own kids. Um, and really um, what I was interested in looking at is whether we could make an economic argument that we might be able to reduce medical spending over time um, with, our, with preterm infants if uh, mothers had more access to paid leave. Um, one of the dynamics that I think is really important to understand and why paid leave with preterm infants may be a little bit different um, is that even when parents have some limited paid leave, um, they often choose to delay taking their leave until the baby is discharged, figuring that they're going to need to be home for those first few weeks. 
There's often um, strong cautions about putting a preterm infant into daycare right away, um, even once they're discharged. And so um, it is very common for, for parents to choose to go ahead and keep working while their baby is in the hospital um, and then to take their leave once the baby comes home. However, um, this prevents the kind of maternal engagement or parental engagement that is associated with improved infant health and development, specifically among preterm infants. Um, and so some examples of the benefits of parental engagement in the NICU specifically are that babies are likely to stay in the NICU sh for a shorter amount of time. Um, and then here's a, um, a typo. They have reduced pain response. Um, so when, when parents are able to hold them during a needle stick or um, you know, changing out an IV, they cry for a shorter amount of time and are able to um, self-resolve um, that, that pain response much more quickly. And overall, those infants have decreased cortisol levels. And so their stress response overall is, is minimized when parents are able to be in the NICU, when the babies can hear their parents' voices, when um, they can smell their parents, smell is important, and when they can have skin-to-skin -skin contact. Um, so for all these reasons, you know, have, offering six weeks of leave and saying, sure, just wait until the baby goes home means that parents are missing out on some really critical, uh, important days and weeks of a potential health intervention. Um, and this is important because one in 10 births in the United States are preterm, but the rates are nearly double among black mothers, as, as Heidi was covering. Um, for low birth weight babies and preterm babies, um, the, the, there is a crisis among black mothers specifically. Um, there's also a crisis in another vulnerable group, which is unmarried mothers or mothers who are single parenting. Um, and so um, there was a study of births among mothers in states with those TDI programs that Jessica mentioned, and it found that the low birth weight births were reduced by 3% and preterm births were reduced by nearly 7%, but this effect was nearly double among black mothers and unmarried mothers. And so um, again, having access to leave um, can be a critically important intervention, not just once a preterm birth has occurred, but also to prevent preterm birth in the first place. So um, the last thing I wanted to mention um, is that I do think that there is an uh, important relationship between health and economic security, and that that needs to be a part of the health conversation. Um, and paid leave is shown to have um, some important effects for parents in terms of boosting their economic security. And so um, there's a number of studies that I've cited here. Most of them come out of California, but they show that working mothers who took leave are 20% more likely to be employed a year after birth. Um, they had almost a 25% higher income than those who didn't take leave. Um, that they're much less likely to use public um, cash assistance benefits um, even a year after the birth of their child. And they're also less likely to have incomes below the poverty threshold a year after the birth of their child. And so th this has, I think, important child health and developmental effects, um, just having a household that's more economically secure. Um, and then also I think that there's a potent argument here for the investment of paid leave potentially alleviating um, state budgets um, as well and promoting um, this kind of the general value for self-sufficiency among um, families. So I'll mention very quickly that um, my team is currently conducting a study of facilitators and barriers to maternal engagement with preterm infants in Colorado NICUs. Um, we have a qualitative paper that's um, coming out that um, describes the multiple barriers that uh, moms experience when they want to be in the NICU caring for their kids, and that juggling work and infant care is one of the most common things that's mentioned. In our sample, um, we have a median length of leave of zero days. Um, and those who do have leave often are saving it for discharge. And so um, we find you know, that that anecdote is supported with our data. Um, and then we are just enrolling our final uh, participants over the next few months, and then we'll be testing whether access to leave is associated with better infant health among this preterm infant sample. Um, and I also wanted to, to mention that um, my team has done a, a recent report on the projected effects of paid leave in Colorado, and Colorado has been debating a paid leave bill this legislative session um, with uh, mixed results that I'm happy to talk about later. 
and um, that we wanted to summarize some of the potential uh, health benefits and the potential for economic savings for the state if we implemented a paid leave program. And so these studies and a few others are summarized in that report. And so if you're looking for things to cite, um, I just refer you to the reference pages on that report. Um, and so just uh, to, to close up, um, I think that, that there is really strong evidence to show that parents' access to paid leave really matters for infant health. And I think Whitney's going to be um, reviewing even more of that literature next. Um, and, but that also that the length of leave is important. And I, I mention this because this was an ongoing debate here in Colorado, this legislative session of, you know, isn't 12 weeks the Cadillac of all paid leave plans? Shouldn't we just go for four weeks or six weeks? Wouldn't that be enough? And I think that there is a growing body of research that shows that, no, that isn't enough especially when you're thinking about um, infants uh, and their families. Um, but I also think that we really need to um, expand the literature on the long-term benefits of paid leave for children beyond that first year, as I mentioned. I think that this is critically important, not just in those first few weeks, but beyond that. Um, and how access to, to caregiving leave um, can affect child health long-term, and so really to test those um, things that is something that I see lacking in the literature. Um, and then if we can do more work to quantify the economic benefit of these health uh, economic impact of these health benefits, um, from my own experience, I think that um, there are many in legislatures around the country who really just want to know what the numbers say. And right now what they see is that um, we're asking people to pay a new premium and budgets are already stretched. But if we can help to make that economic argument for how states and families, uh, insurers, companies will benefit, um, that would be great. So with Thank that, I will much. leave you. Yep. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Don't leave. You have to stay around for <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll questions. stay around, but I'll stop talking. <laughs> okay. That, that was a very uh, interesting presentation as well, very informative. And I would like to ask every speaker to stay within their 15-minute time limit if possible. Um, since we're not all in the same room, I can't hook you off with the crook the way they did in Vaudeville, but um, we're sending you messages, so please look at your uh, screen uh, while you're giving your presentation. I especially like, Jennifer, your presentation because you had such a, a personal angle. I, I had three full-term babies, and I don't think I could have done what you did, so it was great to hear your personal story as well as your research. I'd next like to introduce uh, Whitney Pesek. She is a lawyer and the senior policy ana analyst for Zero to Three. Uh, she is a contributor to the federal policy work of Zero to Three. She has expertise on work and family issues, early care and education, and child welfare. She also has a lot of state experience prior to joining Zero to Three. Whitney served as a juvenile justice specialist and legislative liaison uh, with the Ohio General Assembly Correctional Institution Inspection Committee, where she led uh, oversight, legislative oversight. So I would like to welcome um, Whitney right now. Thank you, Whitney, very much for joining us. Thanks, Heidi, and for the honor of speaking with such an esteemed panel today. And thank you so much to everyone tuning in. Um, I'm going to start with some of the science of early childhood brain development, and then I'm going to discuss how paid leave helps support this critical period of child development. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Zero to Three, we translate the science of early childhood brain development into useful knowledge and strategies for parents, practitioners, and policymakers. We work to ensure that babies and toddlers benefit from the family and community connections critical to their well-being and healthy development. And the science tells us that nothing is more important to who we become in life than the early, close relationships we form from birth. During the first three years of life, emotionally nourishing relationships lay the foundation for lifelong health and well-being. By supporting the caring adults who touch the lives of infants and toddlers, we hope to maximize our long-term impact in ensuring all infants and toddlers have a bright future. At Zero to Three, we envision a society that has the knowledge and will to support all infants and toddlers in reaching their full potential. Science has significantly enhanced what we know about the needs of infants and toddlers, underscoring the fact that experiences and relationships in the earliest years of life play a critical role in a child's ability to grow up healthy and ready to learn. 
we know that infancy and toddlerhood are times of intense intellectual engagement. A baby's brain produces one million new neural connections every second, influenced most significantly by the everyday moments they experience with parents and caregivers. During this time, a remarkable 36 months, the brain undergoes its most dramatic development and children acquire the ability to think, speak, learn, and reason. The early years establish the foundation upon which later learning and development are built. If experience in the experiences in those early years are harmful, stressful, or traumatic, the effects of such experiences become more difficult, not to mention more expensive, to remediate over time if they are not addressed early in life. Most critical for the issue at hand, research demonstrates that for forming secure attachments to a few caring and responsive adults is a primary developmental milestone for babies in the first year of life. As you can see in this chart, the high points on these curves are what researchers refer to as sensitive periods, periods when a child is particularly sensitive to certain types of interactions, which in turn shape certain developing capacities. For instance, there is an optimal period of time for language development. At eight months, babies are programmed to learn any language spoken on Earth. You can see that the optimal time for the development of higher cognitive functioning is age three. That doesn't mean that very young children are masters of higher cognitive functioning, but this is when the brain architecture is being formed and, chi and a child is ready to begin a process that will take the next two decades to fully develop. Remember those brain and human connections I just mentioned? When we're born, we have billions of neurons, but they're not for the most part connected. In the first three years of life, a child's brain will make billions of neural connections at a rate of about one million new connections each second. This slide shows that synaptic connectivity, which documents the proliferation of neurons that takes place in the developing brain. The rate and acceleration of the brain's development in the first six months is unmatched at any other point in life. These connections or synapses in a child's brain are strengthened through repeated experiences which then build the pathways for the, for the way a child learns. And these connections are important. They help babies learn the essentials they need to survive and thrive within their family, community, and culture. It's the quality of a baby's relationships with parents, grandparents, and childcare providers that influence which brain connections are being made. So what does this mean? It means that for babies, early human connections and early experiences matter. As research has provided us a window into how the brain develops and can be nurtured, it has also documented how the early years can lead to profound and lasting gains in school achievement and lifelong success. Research has also exhibited that when babies are not nurtured, brain development is undermined. Now I'm going to pivot to the benefits of paid leave, many of which I'm sure you're familiar with and have been mentioned by Jessica and Jennifer. In the first months and years of life, young children discover the world through experiences with their parents and other caregivers. They are learning about who they are, how to feel about themselves, and what they can expect from those who care for them. Such basic capacities as the ability to feel trust and to experience intimacy and cooperation with others develop from the earliest moments of life. A young child's early relationships, especially with parents, shape the architecture of the developing brain. These relationships require care, consistency, and above all, time. Enacting public policies that provide parents with paid leave from work to care for their young children is critical to the healthy development of children and families. Because early brain connections form the foundation for all learning and relationships that follow, parents and caregivers are on the front line of preparing our future workers, innovators, and citizens. Yet too many working parents and caregivers are forced to choose between caring for a new child and their economic security. Now is the time for policymakers to secure the best beginnings for children and the best future for our country by supporting a national paid family and medical leave program. For babies, every minute and interaction is a lesson in how the world works, how individuals relate to one another, and how they are valued. Caring, consistent relationships experienced by young children can mitigate the impact of stress and help develop the foundations of a child's ability to learn, to form positive relationships, and exercise self-control. It takes several months of focused attention to become a responsive caregiver to a young child, 
establishing a pattern that will influence the child's long-term cognitive, social, and emotional development. The capacity to recognize a caregiver's voice, smell, and face develops around three months of age. Paid time to care gives parents and babies important time to foster these connections. Parents and caregivers may also need time with a new baby to identify and intervene in a variety of developmental difficulties. This is especially important for caregivers of infants who are considered at high risk, such as babies born preterm or at low birth weights and those who have illnesses or birth defects. Studies of two parent opposite sex households show a number of positive outcomes when fathers take leave. Fathers who take two or more weeks off after the birth of a child are more involved in that child's direct care nine months after birth than fathers who take no leave. Involved fathers also promote children's educational attainment and emotional stability. And a father's involvement in the newborn's care in the first six months can mean both mother and baby sleep better. Paid leave is strongly associated, associated with reduced infant and postneonatal mortality rates. Researchers conservatively estimate that providing 12 weeks of job-protected paid leave in the United States would result in nearly 600 fewer infant and postneonatal deaths per year. Time at home with newborns, infants, and toddlers gives parents the time they need to breastfeed, attend well-child medical visits, and ensure that their children receive all necessary immunizations and may have long-term benefits for children's health. California's statewide paid family leave program is associated with improved health outcomes for children in early elementary school, including reduced issues with maintaining a healthy weight, ADHD and hearing-related problems, particularly for less advantaged children, likely due to reduced prenatal stress, increased breastfeeding, and increased parental care during infancy. Time for parents to provide care facilitates the early detection of potential developmental delays at a time when problems can, most effectively, can be most effectively addressed and interventions identified to minimize them. Studies show that paid leave yields higher rates and longer periods of breastfeeding, which reduces the rates of childhood infections. Paid family leave programs in California and New Jersey where mothers take an average of 12 weeks of paid personal medical leave and family leave combined, increase the likelihood of exclusive breastfeeding at six months, which is the duration recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics. In low-income families in New Jersey, new mothers who use the state paid leave program breastfeed on average one month longer than those who do not use the program. Paid leave has health benefits for new mothers. Each week of paid leave up to 12 weeks reduces the odds of a new mother experiencing symptoms of postpartum depression. New Jersey's paid leave program was strongly associated with improvements in new mother's physical health. Parents who use California's paid leave program report that leave has had a positive effect on their ability to care for their new children and to arrange childcare. And in Rhode Island, Parents who use the state program are much more likely to report higher satisfaction with their ability to care for their new children and arrange childcare, better health, and lower general stress compared to parents who do not use the program. Preliminary research in California suggests that paid leave may also help prevent child maltreatment, perhaps by reducing risk factors such as parental stress and depression. Paid leave for a new child's birth or adoption is essential but parents also need paid family and medical leave when other situations require family caregiving. Too often, conversations about paid leave focus exclusively on new moms and babies. And to be sure, the critical importance of parental leave for moms, dads, and kids is well supported by health and economic research, but parental leave is not even half of what's needed. For example, the rates of childhood cancer have been increasing over the past 20 years. Almost half of all pediatric cancer occurs during early childhood. Families who care for a child with cancer incur considerable costs due to travel, reduction or loss of parental employment, out-of-pocket expenses, and inability to draw on assistance programs to supplement or replace lost income. Paid family and medical leave would help alleviate the financial burden and eliminate the fear of retaliation when returning to work after caring for a chronically ill child Babies and toddlers live within a family structure with multiple caregiving needs. True parental leave includes being at your 18-month-old's bedside after open heart surgery, 
not just bonding with a newborn. When parents can attend to a child's early medical needs, infant mortality and the occurrence and length of childhood illnesses are reduced, which in turn lowers private and public health expenditures. Paid leave can give parents and other caregivers time to search for quality child care that meets the unique needs of their families thereby facilitating greater productivity when they return to their jobs after leave. Positive, consistent relationships during a child's early years yield confident individuals who are better equipped for success in school and in life, paving the way for a higher quality workforce and strong economic growth. And with that, I will turn it back over to Heidi. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Whitney. It's great to hear about zero to three and the importance of this um, age period and, and the role that pay, paid leave does pay and can pay if we get more of it. Um, next, and thank you very much for participating in our webinar. Wendy Chun Hoon is our last speaker, but not least, um, and she is the co-director at Family Values at Work, and this you may know as uh, a, a rather effective state-based uh, policy advocacy organization which has been involved in every win and paid sick days and paid family leave in every state and virtually every community in the nation where we've won it and many communities where, of course, uh, they are still struggling. Uh, she uh, works particularly on the organization's efforts to gain support for policies such as paid sick days and family leave insurance uh, in the nation's capital. She is a skilled coalition builder. She coordinates much of uh, Family Values at Work's network of thousands of workers, activists, small business owners, academics, public health experts, and elected officials to build momentum for family-friendly policies. Thank you so much for joining us, Wendy. Thanks, Heidi. Um, you could have done without the back half of that, uh, the bio, and, <laughs> and it makes me feel like I want you to introduce me everywhere. I thought it was really... That was really awesome, and I'm excited to be part of this discussion today. Um, all right, so I'm going to just do a quick, uh, give you a quick sense of who Family Values at Work is, um, and then really dig into how we've applied the data that Jessica and Jennifer and Whitney have shared into our own advocacy, and also how we've used it to engage others uh, in, in deeper advocacy. Um, so let me go ahead and switch that. So we, you know, Heidi said, we're a network of coalitions in 27 states. We're working in partnership with more than 2,000 local groups who, as Heidi said, are representing kids and seniors and women and, um, importantly, from this discussion, breastfeeding groups and public health groups um, and other justice groups, uh, and really fighting for the most inclusive and comprehensive paid sick and safe days policies and paid family medical leave policies. And we you know, we came together 17 years ago on the heels of California winning the country's first paid leave program. That's the start of that timeline that you're looking at. Um, and just, you know, really quickly, because uh, uh, Jessica, I think, said this in some of her remarks, you know, FMLA is and or was then and still is the only federal law that's protecting time to care. Uh, at the time when we formed, five states had already uh, had these temporary disability insurance programs that were providing wage replacement for people's own serious illness or injury, uh, and most have been around since the 1940s. They, you know, these are social insurance programs. They pool small contributions so that workers can then draw a portion of their wages when they're out uh, with a non-work-related injury or illness. In all of these decades, all have remained solvent, and they've kept millions of folks attached to the workforce. They're incredibly effective programs. So to start our story, a coalition in one of those states, California, um, knew that this system could be expanded to include paid family leave. They organized and won that 17 years ago in 2002, and that's really when we formed. Um, the leader of that coalition and a small group of leaders from other states knew that the road to an eventual national program was going to require more wins in the state to really build the movement, the models, and the momentum to win an eventual federal program. And so they formed Family Values at Work to raise money together and share the funding and also share things like organizing strategies and messaging and coalition building lessons. So 
you know, just to fully explore the timeline there, it took six years from California to get to New Jersey's win. It took five more to get to Rhode Island's win, three more to get to New York, and then look at the end of that timeline, you know, thanks to ongoing investments and in, that really helped to build the capacity to win these things, we won three more laws, D.C., Washington State, and Massachusetts, all within a two-year period. Um, again, just to give you a sense of the landscape, there are, you know, two dozen states have introduced legislation this year. We're really hoping that at least two more states join this timeline uh, in passing legislation this year. I think the most important thing to say, though, is that um, each win really in, serves to improve the policy. So what we learned from evaluating the impact from the early states, the California, New Jersey, even Rhode Island, um, and based on the research that partners like IWPR and the Center for Economic Policy Research and Rutgers and Columbia and, you know, pick your favorite research partner, um, and including, really importantly, state-based partners like Jennifer, um, who are connected to the coalitions in their states who, you know, have experienced something personally and really feel that connection. All of this has led each of our coalitions across the network to strive to improve the model by doing things that you've heard on this call, like increasing the wage replacement, by making sure that there is job protection, by pushing for the higher number of weeks, by making sure that there's an inclusive definition of family when it comes to who can care, who's eligible to care. Because we know that these things have impact on child and family health and well-being, and especially for kids and families of color, for kids whose parents are earning low wages, or who are in lower quality jobs, for younger families who have a more, you know, tenuous connection to the labor force, et cetera. Um, so I'm going to show you next our, what I is, think is maybe my favorite of our shareable graphics, um, because what is really our job to do is to boil down all the incredibly rich um, research that we've heard about on this call into something that the coalitions can use and use quickly and sort of popularize in this way. So I just I pulled one of our um, one of our shareable graphics that I think pretty much summarizes um, everything we're talking about today. Um, each one of the campaigns across the country really relies on this kind of data for case making, for organizing, for organizing diverse, you know, and broad coalitions that can really move uh, a policy conversation. So, um, so we're equipping our states with, you know, fact sheets. I'm going to redo our fact sheet based on this conversation today. Um, and the reason why we sort of put it all together and frame it um, as, and we, we thought about this, as intended consequences. These are the intended consequences from paid leave programs. And, um, and the sort of dialogue that's silent here is that a lot of the time the pushback, and Jennifer referenced this earlier, is, oh, well, we like, we like paid leave but there are unintended consequences in terms of cost or fill in the blank, right? Um, and what we know, what we're all talking about today, and um, which I found really helpful, the United States Department of Labor a couple of years ago under the former administration put out a report called The Cost of Doing Nothing because, in fact, we know, and we're talking about now, the costs of, of not having paid leave are being borne right now but they're being borne by families, by infants, in maternal health, um, all the research that Jennifer cited in California. And as a country, we can't afford not to do paid leave. We can't afford anymore not to have paid leave. Um, so, uh, you know, as a lot of the research that's been referenced, states have really led the way in showing how social insurance funds, like the original TDI programs, and now like the seven paid family leave programs that have built on top of some of those early TDI programs, these, re these social insurance, insurance funds really spread the cost so that it is affordable and that these, these funds are self-sustaining. We also rely on really uh, strong partnerships that we have not just with IWPR. I mean, Jessica wasn't joking when she said, I have called her no, no fewer than two times in the last two weeks for just-in-time data analysis for one of the campaigns. Um, but Jennifer, I just want to, you know, say again to you that you've been a critical partner in Colorado's paid family medical leave campaign and really bringing, you know, the research findings and your, you know, your forthcoming research into really powerful testimony that supports paid leave. 
So maybe we can come back and talk about that later. Um, what I want to leave you with is two stories that really exemplify the power of this kind of action research in policy advocacy, but also that's going to be my the first story is about policy advocacy. The second story is going to be about uh, really needing to pay attention to robust implementation campaigns to make sure that these paid leave laws are actually having the intended impact um, on child and family health and well-being. So uh, the picture that I pulled for you today um, it was from a, a very um, really smart campaign as, that was part of New York's effort to win paid leave that sort of got branded as uh, the prescription for paid leave. Uh, and what happened was Nancy Rankin, who maybe some of you know, if not definitely look her up, she's wonderful, and other leaders from uh, New York's paid leave campaign formed a relationship with Dr. Bernard Dreyer, who at the time was the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And he knew all the research that we're talking about on this phone. He knew about, you know, the research on the need for bonding leave, everything Whitney just talked about. And he also understood the need for paid leave in order to get those kinds of outcomes. But what he hadn't realized before, I think, is that he could actually be an advocate and that he could help engage with other health professionals, including, and importantly, pediatricians, to bring forward that data to audiences like legislators and to really um, you know, describe the picture that, they're, that we're looking at here. Um, you know, it, took, it took a little bit to kind of gel those relationships, to engage a network of pediatricians, um, and other health professionals, and it culminated in this amazing forum, which you're seeing the picture of, um, and a press conference, and then these folks actually going to Albany to effectively lobby. Um, just as a side note, so that you can look this up later as well, um, there's a, a documentary filmmaker, Ty Dickens, who we've been working with, who really got to um, who's created this documentary, Zero Weeks, is incredibly powerful on the fact that, you know, the United States is the only country with zero, one of the only one of the only two countries with zero weeks in the world um, of paid leave. And um, anyway, she was there that day to, to video some of it, so it's actually included in the film. Um, and the, here's the bottom line of this story about Bernard Dreyer, is that what he did and what, the, what New York did in that moment was it helped to make the, the um, it helped to really cement the need for 12 weeks as an absolute minimum. And so from New York forward, when you look on that time, the original timeline I showed you, it sealed it for every other state that's followed. Washington has 12 weeks, Massachusetts has 12 weeks, and all of the campaigns that are really a tipping point now, Colorado, Connecticut, Vermont, Oregon, Minnesota, et cetera, all 12 weeks, the conversation has changed for the good and for the future. Um, the next story, last story I'm going to tell you, is about um, New Jersey. So, and this is about, you know, what the work we have to do once we win a law um, to actually make sure that it's being used um, and it's having the greatest benefit. So the New Jersey Time to Care Coalition is what they call themselves. They, um, they you know, have had a program since, 2007, they recently, just as a footnote, went back and won a very important reform that um, is indicative of everything that we've talked about on this call um, and the, pol the types of policy improvements that needed to be made so the law could have the most impact. They just passed that comprehensive reform in January when the, uh, the governor signed it in January. So their law has changed since a lot of the research that we've been looking at today and all for the better. Anyway, they, um, the coalition really set their sights on partnering with a major WIC center, Women, Infants, and Children Center in the state, thinking that, um, okay, that could be a good entree to the populations that we know don't access the program in the rates that we want them to, that they could be accessing, and therefore aren't getting the benefit of it. Um, so they partnered with a, a large WIC center in the state to really try to increase awareness and access to paid leave right in that moment after the birth of a new child. And, you know, they were having frequent meetings with the breastfeeding staff there. They spent a, a lot of time training them on the importance of paid family leave and on the specifics of the New Jersey program. They provided um, tons of resources that the staff could then use with clients and leave in the waiting rooms, et cetera. 
But they really focused in on helping the breastfeeding staff, this one unit within the WIC, understand the importance of paid leave in allowing new moms to successfully initiate and continue, continuing breastfeeding. So everything you said, Jessica, at the start of this call. So, so what's the point? What's the big deal about the story I'm telling you is that when the coalition initially reached out to the WIC Center to form a partnership, they met with some resistance. And, you know, this, the WIC was sort of saying to them, you know, we have so much on our plate. There's so much that we do. There's so much information we need to convey in that moment, that we, those couple of minutes that we have with these families, um, that they weren't convinced. And, um, that they could actually include that in their programming. And it wasn't until they started having this conversation about the um, impact that paid leave can have on initiation and duration of breastfeeding where the, WIC, where the WIC staff suddenly locked in and said, oh, we see how this is mission aligned. And um, I, I remember sort of scratching my head thinking, wow, it feels really obvious to me, but it had to 100% be mission aligned with what they were trying to achieve. Um, and so it was really like applying all the research that we knew in that moment when you're building a partnership with what feels like a really natural partner in terms of outreach and awareness and education and access to the program, but you have to really make sure that you're talking in terms of mission alignment with that group. So it's been a really successful, um, you know, successful partnership. And I think the, 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 what's happening now is that that center, WIC center's uh, experience is, is starting to be spread to the WIC system across the state. So because that one WIC center really figured out this is a benefit that we are providing, this is a piece of information that is going to help our clientele in numerous ways, they're now coaching and encouraging their sister WIC uh, sites across the state to, to be part of this. And that's how, and that's the only way how we're going to get to scale. Um, so I think, you know, um, Robert Wood Johnson had, uh, has a whole, um, like, building a culture of health report that is specific about New Jersey um, and how to build a culture of health. And they talk about this in, in um, maybe less specific ways, but really thinking about how you need to think about access points in the community. Again, really think about how data um, shows how this work is mission aligned, and then think about how to scale it. Um, and I'm, Jessica, I'm walking away with the, the data point you said about 24% increase in, um, in initiation. So I'm wrapping there. I think the last thing I'll say is really just a parting thought about the politics, which is, um, you know, as we all know, kids don't only need us when they're born. <laughs> um, and also, in turn, we need them as we get older. Um, and we all need the time to care for ourselves and for our loved ones. So, you know, w that is why we're working so hard both at the state level, but also right now at the federal level to really make sure that the solution we're talking about is inclusive, it's comprehensive, it covers all kinds of caregiving, and, you know, really a big part of that is documenting the health impact for um, all of these populations, including older kids beyond the infant stage. So thank you so much. Thank you, Wendy, for a very informative and inspiring and motivating uh, talk. I think we uh, learned a lot about how we can uh, push this issue forward. I think, again, although you might think that, you know, doctors and health personnel are exactly the ones who should be the spokesperson persons, my impression is they're not speaking up as much as one would really expect about the importance of this, but it's great that they were so um, prevalent and so vocal in Massachusetts, so that's wonderful to hear about. Um, we are now open for Q&A, so um, participants, I hope you'll send in some questions, and uh, in the meantime, um, I have a couple of questions, uh, which I think I'm going to address the first one to uh, Jessica Milley. I know you were speaking about um, the uh, mothers who, you know, had leave in New Jersey uh, and how it affected them um, in their ability to breastfeed and initiate in length. But uh, I think that leave can have different definitions, and I, I wonder how you dealt with that. For example, one... Um, 
one idea of leave is just you're away from work. I know when the PSID asked about leave, they asked women how many of you have leave when you have a baby, and they also asked the husbands how many of your wives have leave when she has a baby, and 75% said yes. And I think that was because they were combining their vacation and their sick days and and uh, were expecting to be able to go back to their job since the 1978 Pregnancy Discrimination Act was passed, they were able to go back to their jobs instead of being summarily dismissed, as was the case before 1978. Um, and so they considered it a leave, and it was even, you know, partially paid by storing up their vacation and their sick days. But I think now we tend to talk about paid family leave, and it doesn't always have job protection. So I'm wondering if you looked at what kind of job protection there is in New Jersey and whether you could see a difference between the mothers who had job protection and the mothers who didn't. And anything else you want to comment about is fine as well. Uh, sure. Um, so that's a pretty tricky uh, question to answer. Um, one of the great frustrations of my work in this field and in paid sick leave is that the data on uh, these sorts of uh, policies and worker access to them is extraordinarily limited. <laughs> um, it's really tough to answer all of the research questions that you would really like to answer um, with the existing data. And so in the data that we have access to, the National Immunization Survey, we don't really have that granular information uh, about job protection, how much leave the um, individual took and whatnot. And so what we're really looking at in our research is just the impact of potentially having access to this uh, additional leave through the paid family leave program in New Jersey. And so, you know, ideally we would like to look at individuals um, you know, taking of leave and how much leave they're taking on uh, breastfeeding rates, but it's just not possible in the data. So again, we're just looking at the impact of the potential um, access to the leave in, in New Jersey through the state level uh, program. And is any of the leave in New Jersey uh, job protected, job guaranteed? Uh, I do not believe that New Jersey's law um, includes a job protection provision. So usually what happens in states that have paid family leave programs is that workers simultaneously will apply for FMLA leave if they're eligible, and the FMLA leave provides that job protection for them. The New and Jersey that reform that I was talking about, Heidi, includes mm -hmm. for um, slightly more coverage than the FMLA to firms of 30 or more. With job protection. Correct. Right. And that's passed, that, that new protection? Yep. It was signed into law in January. Okay. Great. Um, so just to remember, though, that the um, federal law only gives job protection for uh, people who work at firms with 50 or more. And also, you have to have worked there at least half time for the entire 12-month period. So only certain, you know, that's pretty long tenure, especially for young mothers. Many mothers are young, and they often don't have that. So that is a concern that the, when we look at specifically uh, younger mothers, the federal law is providing less protection to them than it does to older mothers who are likely to meet those uh, job tenure and uh, requirements. So it, it's an interesting area. I mean, it's a critical area that we have to think about when this legislation is being passed, the importance of actually having the right to go back to work. But that's wonderful that we are seeing some reforms. And I think some of the new laws, like Washington State, do include a job guarantee. But I know some of the other panelists might be able to Give us a rundown on which state programs do and yeah, don't have Yeah, I, I can, guarantee. Heidi. This is Wendy. Rhode Island was the first to really guarantee job protection. Um, New York followed suit. Mass Washington did not quite get, it wasn't quite able to get there. Um, Massachusetts does. And obviously, you know, these states setting the, setting the path um, and setting the, the benchmark. 
no, none of the uh, laws that are really at tipping point now um, don't uh, include them in the proposal. So all of the new laws. And it is a conversation. We... Yeah, the ones that are really sort of close to the finish line, uh, this legislative session, right now, uh, the legislative, state legislative sessions are wrapping up. Um, in, in the federal proposal, the Family Act, which is the closest to, to what's been done in the state, um, mm -hmm. it does not yet include job protection, and it needs to be an active conversation. Right, right. So um, the District of Columbia, which passed their law about a year and a half ago, or two and a half years ago, um, doesn't have a job guarantee either, other than the federal one and the one that D.C. passed, you know, previously, which applies to uh, firms with 20 or more workers. And an interesting thing we found as an employer, I mean, we, you know, we're one of those progressive employers that has to give everything we're working on. But one of the things, so we even follow the FMLA, we're too small to be covered by that. But one of the things that um, we found about the D.C. law is that 20 workers doesn't mean 20 at one time. It means that in the last 12 months, have you ever had at least 20 workers on your payroll? In that case, you're covered. So... I think that's a pretty progressive way to define, you know, the number of workers because states can define it all different ways. So that would mean an employer, you know, that has a lot of turnover during the year isn't able to, uh, has to count, if they go through three workers in one year for the same job, they have to count that as three. And so it, it covers more people. So I think it's, you know, there's a lot in, there's a lot in the details we might be able to get, uh, or I should say the advocacy community might be able to get some pretty generous benefits, you know, if we really look into the details and see see what's there and what we can put there. So I have a similar question for Jennifer. Um, I wondered um, to what extent you were able to incorporate access to job guaranteed leave in your research and especially that new research that you're where you're adding the last uh, group of interviews, I guess, and access to paid leave, meaning, again, a paid job guaranteed program. Yeah, so in the research that we're currently conducting, um, you know, we didn't actually ask whether their leave is job protected, but we did ask for the number of days of any unpaid leave and then any paid leave. Um, and we asked a clarifying question about um, it, whether they they knew um, what kind of paid leave it is. I think not everybody even knows whether they're taking parental leave or vacation time or PTO or, you know, and, and different employers call them different things. So um, we have just the sheer number of days of paid leave, sheer number of days of unpaid leave, and then we have the clarifying category, you know, they can choose categories of um, what's providing the pay. Um, we also are collecting data about their employment status um, and it's a, you know, in retrospect, were they employed before giving birth? But then also we ask these questions a second time six weeks after the discharge of their baby, and we ask them again if they're still employed um, and if they've gone back to work already and um, how many days of, of leave unpaid and paid they had. And what's interesting is that the answer about um, days of leave actually differs for a lot of parents from um, their first, you know, uh, it's two weeks after the birth of their child that they do the first survey, and then um, six weeks after the discharge of their child, they do the second survey. And I found there's discrepancies in the number of days of leave. Um, and I don't know if that's because once they've given birth to a potentially medically complex baby that they've had to go back and negotiate with their employer for more leave. And, you know, we see all these stories all the time of, you know, coworkers chipping in extra days of leave and that kind of thing, and that I'm, I'm wondering if, if those dynamics are happening with some of these families. Um, but once we get our full cohort enrolled, I hope to be able to poke around in the data a little more to find out what's going on there. Um, but, uh, and I hope that the employment status question will help us to get at um, that job protection a little bit. But in hindsight, um, you're right that we should have added a question about whether they know their job is, is waiting for them when they go back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course you can be surprised too. You can have thought that it was waiting for you and then find out that 
it isn't or they're not willing to extend it no matter how exactly. difficult or no, no matter you know how difficult sh- what difficult shape the children are in yeah child or children yeah well okay that's great i don't know do we have any other questions online here Mm-mm, not we do not not yet but no. um if you would have questions of each other that would be great Whitney has had to run out of her building because of a fire alarm, <laughs> and uh, uh, she may be back. You never know. <laughs> Jennifer, it's Wendy, um, and until another question pops up, I just wanted to – I know that you were an integral part of the campaign for Pay Leave in Colorado, and I just wondered if you wanted to say you know, what that was like and what your experience was as a – predominantly a researcher um, in, a, in yeah. a, inst- a university institution, um, but working with the coalition so closely. Yeah, it's been an interesting few months here in Colorado. Um, I uh, had gotten engaged um, on the paid leave issue in Colorado. Um, was actually, I was my one of my kids at the time, he was 15 months old and had been admitted into the hospital again with pneumonia. And as I was sitting there with him day in and day out, unable to leave the hospital, thanking everything that I had a job that I could go back to, um, the uh, primary sponsor of paid leave introduced a a robust paid family leave bill. This was back in 2015. And so I emailed her immediately and said, how can I help? (laughs) Because this is unbelievable. Um, And so I've been um, in communication with her uh, over the years as she has reintroduced the bill and, as my research has progressed and I've, I have more that I can cite in terms of um, data from Colorado, um, and I go and I testify in the legislative hearings. Um, this year, in the midterm election, the Colorado um, legislature, the, the Senate changed hands um, so that we have a Democratic majority in the House and Senate, as well as a Democratic governor. And so a lot of folks thought that this was the year when paid family leave would probably become a reality in Colorado. Um, Unfortunately, the bill um, hit some unexpected road bumps, and um, just this week um, the primary sponsors had to renegotiate, and um, what it looks like is going to be passed and um, signed by the governor is a bill that authorizes a series of um, feasibility studies and actuarial study Um, and an examination of whether uh, paid leave would be more efficiently uh, administered by a third-party administrator versus the state. Um, And they're going to complete those studies in the next year and then introduce a follow-up bill next year in the 2020 session that would actually authorize creation of the paid leave uh, insurance program. And um, so I continue to be involved in in going and – you know, summarizing the research, the legislators, there are a number of senators that asked me to come down and meet with them privately. Um, And it's helpful that I've been able to kind of be there as an independent researcher voice um, and um, kind of walking them through, this is what we know from the research and here are kind of the open questions and that sort of thing. Um, But as I mentioned, I, I stay in touch with the bill sponsor and hope that I can continue to support because um, I, I do feel that there's really solid research out there that shows that this is really beneficial for the state and for families. So. Yeah, thank you for all that work. Thank you very much. I think um, we actually are out of time, so unless someone else wants to make a burning comment, I just want to uh, thank everyone again for participating. Uh, to let you know that the uh, slideshows are on our website or will be up on our website Mm -hmm. along with the recording. Uh, To thank all of the presenters, of course, for an excellent um, job and an excellent overview of the issues and excellently presented. So um, thanks, everyone, and we'll see you again next month talking about how adults can be affected uh, positively in their health outcomes by the presence of paid family care leave. So thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.